Bene, buonasera a tutti, benvenuti alla seconda uh, conferenza della serie Il punto sul paesaggio. Eh, Quest'oggi abbiamo con noi eh, Roger Marboni. Il titolo della conferenza è Illuminare il paesaggio, eh, della seconda della serie, eh, abbiamo ancora la terza in questa primavera, che sarà eh, dedicata alla fotografia, infatti Jean Michel Andesi è un fotografo francese, dal detto Identità dei paesi <coughs> urbani, che andrà in onda il 5 giugno del 2014, sempre alle ore 18. Eh, Quest'oggi abbiamo così con noi eh, Roger Narboni, nato in Algeria nel 1953, è un lighting designer francese, si è laureato nel 1975 all'Università d'Orsay vicino a Parigi, con una tesina in elettronica. Ha frequentato per quattro anni l'École Nationale des Beaux-Arts tra il 1971 e il 1974, Dopo diversi anni di viaggi all'estero e tre anni passati in New York, è tornato in Francia nell'81, dove organizza eh, diverse mostre riguardanti la luce e l'illuminazione. Nell'88 ha fondato lo studio specializzato in Lighting Design Concept vicino a Parigi. Da allora realizza diversi lavori in lighting design in ambito paesaggistico, urbano e architettonico a differenti scale. Nel 1987 ha fondato una nuova disciplina chiamata Light Urbanism e da allora ha realizzato più di 110 lighting master plans in Francia e all'estero. Membro fondatore dell'associazione francese dei lighting designer recentemente presidente e fondatore dell'associazione Concepteur Lumière Saint Frontière. Roger Norboni ha insegnato fin dal 2009 all'Ecole Nationale Supérieure de la Nature e du Paysage a Blois e all'Ecole Nationale Supérieure du Paysage a Versailles, entrambe in Francia. Quindi lascio la parola al nostro ospite, non prima di aver promosso il suo ultimo libro, L'éclairage des villes vers euh, un urbanisme nocturne, che riprende un po' verso un urbanisme di Le Corbusier, ma questa volta di notte, ripresa di notte. Bene, quindi la sua parola. Grazie. Uh, so, this lecture will be in English. Uh, I wanted to thank first uh, Antonio to invite me and to give me the opportunity for a couple of hours very peacefully because very often we do lecture of 20 minutes, 40 minutes and we have to rush to try to express things. So here we will have time fortunately and even to debate and discuss at the end. So I, I will try to talk about light and landscape. Um, I will say try because it's still a topic that is difficult to talk about, uh, especially since um, the last years where uh, we all know that uh, sustainability, ecology, light pollution, biodiversity at night have been a very important asset and challenge. But still, when I started a long, long time ago already, my first project, and I will present it to you, was a river But at that period, the mayor of the city of New York asked me to light. And it was so bizarre for me to light a river. So I was very happy and very pleased to do so. But uh, I did not expect that the mayor could ask someone to light the landscape. Uh, before explaining this project, um, what we have been doing since 1988, since we created uh, Concepto Studio, um, We have a studio near Paris, in the Paris suburb, very close to Paris. And uh, we are eight person together, dealing with lighting, dealing with light, and doing lighting design all year long. I wanted to show you some projects that were, for us, uh, I would say the most important project maybe in our um, development and in, our, in the way we, we construct this profession. I was one of the first lighting designer with some other colleagues. We were three or four maximum in France in 1988. 
Uh, what is lighting designer? Maybe for many people that doesn't know what is lighting designer, in this sense, when we started that in 1988 in France, the idea was to deal with light and lighting in urban environment. That means with architecture and public spaces and city environment. Um, there was a lot of lighting designer dealing with theater, dealing with movies, dealing with uh, events, light events, things like that. Uh, especially because in 1989 you all know that the French Revolution was uh, uh, celebrating the bicentenaries, 200 years of French Revolution. So there was a lot of projects that was light events or way of dealing with light for a temporary purpose for festival or a special events. And uh, there was almost no one dealing with uh, urban environment, with architecture, out outside the architecture, not inside the architecture, not interior lighting, how we call it. So we decided, a, a group of people, to start this new profession, to dedicate ourselves to lighting the urban environment and to, in a way, be specialist or expert into this uh, important uh, thing. We thought it was a very important thing to do because um, most of the cities and urban spaces and architecture at that period were lit only in a functional way with a very functional approach. Most of the lighting, the public lighting, were dedicated um, to cars and to car drivers' vision. Uh, nothing was done for ambience, nothing was done for pedestrian, nothing was done to create scenery or to create an overvision of, um, of the environment or to create uh, an urban landscape at night. So we started to do that and uh, it was quite difficult at the beginning because really uh, there was not much uh, client willing to do so, or not much uh, people ready to order this kind of project. But with the celebration of the bicentenary of French Revolution, project started to rise, and uh, and we started as lighting designer to work on this kind of project, but on a permanent base because we really wanted to be uh, dedicated to permanent lighting, not only to temporary of or event lighting. So uh, the first project we did is a river. I will show it later on. This is the second project we did because um, it was very nearby the city of New York. It was like uh, 50 kilometers away only. And uh, these people, that was um, authorities of this uh, citadel, public authorities, they went to see our project in the river. And then they decided to to launch a competition in order to start a project, a lighting project on this citadel, which is a very, very large citadel. And uh, they asked us if we could deal with the lighting on this scale and uh, do something different that usually was done on monuments and other heritage buildings. So for us, it was really a very important project. It was uh, financed by European funds, uh, dedicated only to lighting. and. Uh, in five, six years, phase by phase, step by step, we finished to light the full citadel. And it was a, a village into a citadel uh, without any lighting, so we had to create everything. And it changed quite a bit the vision and perception of the people living there. It was 100 people living there. And it changed also totally the vision of the citadel from the inner vision as well as the outer vision. And already this was a landscape uh, project for us because we wanted to light the landscape around the citadel. All around the citadel is this um, oyster uh, water um, reception. All the oysters in this region are developed into these water systems. And we thought that with this lighting we could do something for this uh, water system and also we could show all the fortification of the citadel that were way outside the citadel environment. Uh, we faced our first, uh, that was one of the first projects, but also one of the first defeat against uh, people fighting against lighting into a natural environment because um, we had to present this project to the Department of um, environment of uh, this region and they say there is no way you're going to put any lighting into the natural environment. 
we propose uh, fixtures with uh, photovoltaic uh, um, cells and we propose system that won't uh, damage in any sense the natural environment. There was no cable, no wire, no civil works, nothing, but still they didn't want any lighting into it because they thought that it would be something incorrect to light a natural environment. So we did not realize anything outside the citadel, we just realized all the lighting inside the citadel. But still, we went on working on project, and as you will see later on, we did a lot of project into the landscape with people with maybe a little more open mind. Then uh, we started to work on urban spaces. That, that was the first competition we did, uh, and it was the first time in France that there was a competition with a pluridisciplinary team. That means an architect, a landscape architect, engineer, and lighting designer. The competition was in 1991. We finished the first phase in 1994. Uh, for us, it was uh, really important to start this um, competition and to prove that uh, adding a lighting designer into a pluridisciplinary team would be something very, very interesting, both for the team for the architect and landscape architect, and also for the client and the public authorities. Because we could dedicate ourselves to the night vision or to the night ambiences. Uh, we could deal with everything related to photometry, to techniques, to uh, quantity of light, to sequences, ambiences. It was one kilometer long avenue or boulevard. And uh, it was with a tramway line, so it was quite complicated. And uh, it was very important for us because we started to, to launch some new way of lighting the public spaces. First uh, of all, we wanted to change the tonality of lighting, the color of the lighting. At that period, everything was done in high pressure sodium with orange lighting. And that was the first start in France when we launched white light. All the project one kilometer long was all realized with white light. And um, there was no difference between the street lighting and the pedestrian lighting or the pavement lighting. That was not at all something usual. It was the first time we decided and we proved that we could light with the same tonality of light, one street and one pavement and uh, all with white light. So this was a struggle. It was a long time ago, as you can see, 24, 20 years. When we started the studies, it was 23 years ago. But uh, we convinced the mayor to do so, to follow our ideas, and uh, we made some tests, and we, we succeeded to convince him, and uh, he accepted the fact that it would be only a white light from facade to facade. It was. The avenue was uh, from 40 meters large to 70 meters large, depending on where you were in the avenue. And we succeed to, to really do something with white lining. So for us, it was really a very important challenge. The so second very important thing was that we wanted to do this lighting in an indirect way. That means most of the lightings were with indirect light. There was a light going to a, a reflector, and this reflector will send back the light to the pedestrian place. So again, this was uh, quite unusual. We had again to fight uh, against technicians and engineers of cities and to convince again that this would be a good thing to do. We had to fight for the um, illuminance level. We have to fight uh, for many, many things. There was no norms at that period. Now there is norms everywhere, and we have to deal with lighting and with norm, with flux requirements and uh, candelabra square meter requirements and a lot, a lot of uh, constraints that make this profession even uh, more professional. But still, at that period, we had to fight again a lot about uh, new way or I would say new approach of uh, urban lighting. But when we, we were successful enough to have an over project, we were successful enough to demonstrate that the lighting designer could handle a public space project on a very, very large scale. And uh, well, the profession started to grow, and uh, nowadays we are 110 people working as independent lighting designer in France, and many, many others in, in Europe and in the world. And with uh, 
recent arrival of Chinese lighting designer, we soon gonna be thousands. So we we do work now almost every time with architect and landscape architect on project, developing new project, renovation project or new or construction project that are public spaces, architecture, as you will see, districts, cities, sometimes new cities. And we work uh, even um, in, a, in a big, big growth on large, large scale project and uh, what we call lighting strategies and light urbanism. And I will show you some example later on. Uh, we, we work also on this very bizarre project with Gilles Vexlar that you know here in the Master of uh, Paisage. Uh, he asked us if we could integrate all the lighting into these concrete poles. He didn't want anything that was outside of the pole. And uh, we had really to, to, to realize something very strange because we incorporate projectors and fixtures uh, into this big, big uh, concrete pole that was 15 meters high without anything getting out of the pole and still fulfilling the requirement of um, the street le lux level and the pavement lux level. And well, we, it was a two, one kilometer long boulevard and again we succeed to prove that we were able to do some lighting first with a very, very original or uh, aesthetic approach and secondly fulfilling all technical expectation. And uh, one of the projects also I really like is this project because we were asked to light um, a highway crossing, so two highways that were constructed and were crossing each other. And the client said, I don't want any pole. I don't want any vertical things into my uh, beautiful landscape. Uh, so try to find something to, to light this huge highway crossing without any any pole. So we, we say, any pole is not possible. Do, would you accept two poles? And he said, well, two, okay. So we designed poles of 50 meters high. Each pole is 50 meters high. And with two poles and only eight projectors, we were able to light the whole highway crossing. So that was very important as well, because uh, for us, it was a project maybe one of the really first projects in between a land art attitude and a lighting design scheme. Uh, this pole had been designed by us at the studio in, in 3D, that was the beginning of the 3D uh, computer software. And there were to be realized, it was very complicated to realize because they are conical and um, it, each piece to construct them is totally different. There is 217 pieces that are totally different to uh, assemble. So for us, it was really a project that was very good to to do, and we were trained to do this project, um, and we we learned a lot of things from this project. We had also to uh, to put these poles into position on islands of concrete. We were in the ground that there was um, very that was very muddy and uh, very wet. We had to dig uh, 40 meters down to the ground to fix the poles and maintain it because the poles are, are not uh, straight. They go seven degrees of inclination. But still, it works. And uh, the good things about it is it's that they will last at least uh, maybe 20 or 30 years more because um, very often the lighting project we do we do them for 25 years, 30 years maximum because lifetime of projectors and uh, now uh, source and the LEDs is very short and getting shorter and shorter. So most of the lighting project we do after 30 years, they are almost totally dead. We have to change them or to renew them. This is one thing that makes things totally different from a landscape architect or even an architect, because very often a landscape architect will work for a century, maybe more centuries. And an architect very often used to work for centuries. Now it's more close to 30 or 50 years. But for a lighting designer, whatever project you do, you know that uh, 30 years after you will have to redo it or someone else will redo it. And uh, the project will not be able to be seen. And it's the case for the river project. But in this condition and because of um, this is masked in steel, 
stainless steel, they will stay there unless someone put them away, but at least they will be able to be seen in 20 or 30 years and it might be the only project that uh, people will be able to be uh, visible from our work. So this is something very important because working as a lighting designer, you know that you, you cannot fight against the time. You have to work with the time. And uh, you know that uh, lighting is a trend like many other trends and um, you can get out of trend very quickly. Some mayors renew projects every 10 years, even 15 years, maybe now a little bit less because of the crisis, but still a lot of uh, public authorities very often when they change, when they arrive, they want a new project and some of the projects we did already, we renew them. So it's something very special into our profession. And uh, well, I think it's a good thing about it because um, especially when you do project into the landscape because you're not gonna damage the landscape. You are there just for 20 years and the uh, landscape will stay there for centuries and some landscape will stay there for thousands of years. So, I think it's a good thing because you can try things, you can test things, you can modify the perception, you can um, make people having a different way of looking to things and well, you are not damaging or you are not, uh, I would say, pushing anything into the landscape or into the urban environment and you can take away your project and or you ta can take away the fixture and the lightings and, and give back the space as clean as uh, you it was before you started. Um, this is a project we did with uh, James Turrell. James Turrell is an artist, uh, as you might know, dealing with light for a very, very long time. Uh, I had the chance to see one of his first show in New York in 1979. Uh, James Turrell was unknown totally in Europe. In, the first show he made in Europe was in France in 1983. No one ever heard about James Turrell. When I talked about James Turrell in uh, the Ministry of Culture in France in 1981, no one ever heard about him. So um, I tried to explain that flights was something very important and that we could deal with flight with an artistic approach, but no one uh, never understand what I was saying. And fortunately, he came in 1983 to make a large show in Paris. And that was the start of his uh, I would say, menstruation of work in, in Europe. Um, that was interesting to work with him because uh, he was really focused on uh, how colors could be created into sequences and with different speed of changing colors. That was quite the beginning of using colors to play on facade and using them what we call a dynamic way. And most of the people were using um, computer with pre-program change of lighting. And no one was really thinking about uh, how these changes and these sequences could be held by a designer or an artist. And Terrell really worked on that and tried to s demonstrate that um, the sequence and how one color follow another one could totally transform your perception. So that was very interesting to work with him on that. We did work also into the building and that was something because they asked us uh, to make a, almost a daytime lighting. They wanted that the, the space would be with a level of flux of 2,500. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of flux. It's even more than a stadium when you show fan of soccer teams or rugby teams, uh, it's much more than you have normally into a stadium. And it was a space of 900 square meters and they, the client wanted this space to be lit in a very, very bright condition so it would be exactly like being outdoor. And also they wanted that um, light condition and the vision condition would never change whatever happened outside. If there was uh, clouds passing on the sky, if the night was falling, if there was a storm or if uh, the, the weather was not in the same at the beginning. All this to make the perception of the cars because this is a presentation room that means they, they bring the models of new cars to take decision if they're going to launch this new cars or not. 
So this is very important because it make it means that um, there will be a process of industrialization and a lot of money to put into this process. So these decisions are very important. So they didn't want to be bothered by light movement or light changes or level of light. So if they ask us for a blind room, totally blind, without any possibility to look outdoor, and they ask us for daytime lighting, and they ask us for no shadows, it was like a Christmas, you know, they say no shadows, daytime lighting, no possibility to look outside, no changes during two days, three days, what, whatever we decide to stay there and to look to the cars. And for me, it was the first time where I had the chance to start with the lighting and work with the architect so he could design the architecture according to the lighting demand. It never happens again, I can tell you. <laughs> Very often, architect designs the space and then ask for a lighting, discussing more or less depending of what they think about the lighting and how they deal with the lighting designer. But that was the first time lighting was the key issue to design the space. We, di we started to design the space with the lighting condition and lighting constraints, even the shape of the space the material of the space, the way the lighting will go into the space, all this was decided because of the lighting purpose. So it was a very, very interesting project. Unfortunately, no one can see it because it's totally secret, unless you know very well Mr. Peugeot. And uh, it's, it gave an impression, sometimes light is something you can not even understand how it works, because you go into this room, and you think like you're floating into the space. I don't know why, <laughs> but it works like that. You go into the room, and uh, after a while, after two, three minutes, you really feel like there is no more gravity because of the light condition, the perception of your body, the perception of your brain. You really feel like you're floating into something, like you're floating into a sky or into a cloud. So it's something incredible. And that was the first time for me that these kind of things, I could never think about it. I could never design something thinking the people will float. That would be great, you know? And sometimes, with lighting, you reach some points that you don't know at all, and it make it more magical. And it gives you the capacity of understand that there is a lot, a lot, a lot of things that we don't understand at all. So we still have a lot of things to learn about lighting. We have a lot of things to discover. And I think it's uh, fantastic about this profession because I've been doing that for more than 20, if I count with my first work as an artist, it's more than 30 years. So really, I still discover a lot of things and I'm sure that I will discover a lot of things into this uh, incredible material that is lighting. Uh, we did also more classical projects like um, contemporary art museum, we did museum, and many, many shows into this museum. So using natural light, dealing with natural light, this one was one of the first projects we deal with natural light, and we were dealing with natural light for the architects because they did not know exactly how to deal with the natural light, how to calculate uh, the level of natural light into the space, and how to, to calculate this natural light in order to not uh, damage uh, the, the paintings or the sculptures. So for us it was uh, also a new development of our profession and we work more and more with natural light. We worked also on parks. Uh, very often we work on parks even if the parks are closed at night. This is very bizarre. But uh, in France, in many cities, parks are closed at night. Even new parks, they ask to be totally closed. But they want lighting. They want lighting for safety reason or for security reason or because the police sometimes say, I want to see inside. Even if I don't go inside, I want to see inside. So they ask us to make some lighting and no one is going to the park during the night. They think that Sometimes they could open it, maybe for a special reason, or special nights, or when there is, for example, the music festival in, on June 21st. 
but still it gives us a lot of freedom because we can really do lighting like we wish to do. We don't have to, to deal too much with uh, programs and constraints because no one will go there. So we can even deal with contrast and, um, and alleys that would be dark. We can play on the playground because no kids will be there. So we can do lighting <laughs> on the playground in a very unusual way. And well, it's, it's funny in a way because we have budget for that. We work with the architect and the landscape architect and we all think that maybe someday some mayor will decide to open the park at night. We work also on big infrastructure like tramway line. Um, lighting is very important into uh, a large infrastructure like a tramway line, for example, because you have to deal like in this case on 13.5 kilometers, you have to give, um, in a way, a currency and um, a line that will people understand very quickly and very clearly. And you have also to deal with sequences, with transversality, with uh, diverse uh, way of uh, going to this tramway, getting out of this tramway, finding all the stations and, and so on and so on. You have to deal with the uh, client that is inside the tramway. You have also to deal with the vision of the driver of the tramway because it's all different constraints. You have to deal also with all the people around the tramway that walk or drive into the public space. So they are very, very interesting project. We did almost 12 tramway line in France and we're doing right now one in, in Switzerland. And these projects also are very interesting because we can really deal with luminous ambiences dedicated mostly for pedestrians because uh, the main strategy for a tramway is to make a public transportation to lower the number of cars into the, the streets and so to develop as much as possible public space for pedestrians and for cycles. <coughs> So we really can handle this luminous ambience for pedestrian and we have the capacity on this project to create new way of dealing with pedestrian and using light as well as to signal or to, to show different way of getting to a place to another and also using light to uh, host or welcome the people near the tramway or not near the tramway. And also we have to deal especially here in Grenoble we had to deal with this uh, very important relationship between <coughs> the tramway and the landscape around like the, the mountains that are very very well visible into um, the city of Grenoble and we wanted to create a lighting that would not bother the possible vision of the big mountains around at dawn but also at night time. Uh, Sometimes we make projects with very, very simple things. Uh, this is a path into a, a forest, a little forest. <coughs> and before we started this project, it was lighted with uh, high pressure sodium projectors, 400 watts, very big one. And this little path goes from the city center of Chateau Malabry, that is a suburb of Paris, to a professional high school. So kids are going at winter time, they cross this forest from the, where they live to where they're going to study and they come back again during winter time at night time. And they were doing that going under uh, orange atmosphere, high pressure sodium with a lot of glare, a lot of uncomfort. And uh, well, the municipality asked us if we do something to make it more poetic or more sensible, maybe to different atmosphere, and we fulfilled with this proposition. We designed the fixture, and uh, we designed also the mask in order to uh, get the lighting only to the path, and any lighting will go to the vegetation behind the path. So everything is directed to the path. And uh, just for the little story, we designed the mask with um, uh, special leaves <coughs> from the trees, uh, Japanese trees. And uh, well, we had uh, quite a lot of problems because uh, our authority thought it was marijuana leaves and they said you should not do this kind of leaf for kids. <laughs> and we had to, to prove them that this leaf was not at all a leaf of marijuana. So that was very funny because we were arguing for months about the drawing of the leaf. So that was so inhabitual, you know, it's so in unusual because uh, we thought project will, will 
raise maybe questions or debates, uh, but the only debates was, is that leaves of marijuana? <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes, as a lighting designer, you get stuck into problems that has nothing to do with lighting, but, uh, well, fortunately enough, we, we realized it, and uh, kids are very pleased, and I'm not sure that we think it's marijuana leaves, anyway. Um, well, since we started this, this profession, we, we get asked for a very bizarre project, like this parking um, silo, parking building. Uh, a lot of projects are now with lighting, even if it's not something very usual, because people think lighting should be dealt in a global way, on a holistic approach. That means here, we do the lighting for the cars, the park. Uh, so all the stores where the cars are. We do the lighting also to make an image, a nocturnal image, a night image of the building. And we do the lighting as well to create something different in relation with the facades and the building with the urban environment. Um, again, in parks, sometimes we use the lighting just to symbolize something. Like in this case, we symbolize what is called the inner railway loop in Paris. It's an inner railway loop that's um, existing since a century, but it doesn't work anymore. And it crossed this park, and we proposed, when we were doing the lighting master plan of Paris, that the inner railway loop could be symbolized and, uh, and revealed by a special lighting system with LEDs and photovoltaic poles. And again, this park is closed at night, no one go into it, but at least from far away, when you are outside the park, you can see this uh, lighting that symbolizes the inner rail group. Um, as I said, some buildings now, uh, and some clients ask for lighting. This is a waste plant. These waste plants are very important because they are, in a way, uh, they are needed to be as close as possible to the city center for sustainable reasons. Because if you have trucks that goes to bring the waste all days and all night, it's really not good at all for uh, pollution. And the client asked us if we could change uh, the image of his building that was renewed with architects and if we could give a positive vision of his building instead of having the neighbors uh, complaining because we were living nearby a waste plant and uh, it was smelling bad and it was a lot of uh, disturbance and a lot of tracks going um, back and forth. So we proposed this lighting. It's a dynamic lighting. It worked like if it was uh, some rains going on the buildings and uh, we play with many, many rains. Um, uh, we, we studied our rains were working in different places in the world, like tropical rains or Britain rains or English rains. And we, we transform the way this rain goes and the way this rain can be seen into rhythm because uh, raindrops make rhythm. If you listen to rain when you are in a room and you don't see the rain falling down, you just listen to it, you will know if the rain is getting stronger or if the rain is slowing and you will know if the rain is stopping or not. So this is only rhythm. And light, especially when you talk about dynamic like it's only rhythm as well. So you can really transform this rhythm and these um, periods between the raindrops into time of lighting and time of dimming. And it was a very interesting project because it works. I mean, people will think rain is going onto the building and they, they will really appreciate to see the rain evolving on the building. We very often now um, make projects where energy saving is one of the main criteria to, for the jury or for the competition to be the one that is the winner. So this is going to be the rule, I think, because um, energy consumption is really uh, a very important uh, asset in our countries. And um, very often on large competition, on competition, a very important one, energy consumption is given as a criteria and if you have a very nice project with a high energy consumption, you will never win. Same if you have a poor project with a poor energy consumption, you will never win, but you try to do as much as possible a very good project with a low energy consumption, and sometimes because of the energy consumption, you win the project. If that was the case here, 
we decided to light this um, aqueduct, uh, lighting the space as a whole of the structure and not lighting <coughs> the wall of the structure. In doing that, we were able to lower the energy consumption because we were lighting very small surface of the structure of the bridge. It's almost like a bridge. And doing that, we were really lowering the energy consumption of a very, very long uh, infrastructure of one kilometer. Uh, this was a project in Italy, Torino. <coughs> uh, it's a heat plant. It was uh, redesigned and renewed by uh, a French architect, also Italian architect, Jean-Pierre Buffy. And uh, it was very funny because, um, as you might know, there is uh, laws in Italy against light pollution. You are not able to put light that goes from the ground up. And in this case, that was the only way we could light this structure. So that was a discussion with the public authorities. And again, the architect decided to help us, so he constructed the facade in a bent way like that, so no light will go outside the facade. But all the light is up lighting, but the way the shape has been designed, all the light is contained by the facade. And this is something very interesting. When you work on a project from the very beginning, you can really make a very good team with the architects if uh, there is a good relationship, and that was the case here. And you can really fulfill all the expectations, you can respect the rules, you can respect the regulation, and you can still do something that is uh, um, what you wish to realize. And also, because of the stainless steel panels, we get all the lighting coming from outside, all this high pressure sodium reflection totally transform and construct the facade vision. And this, um, I would say, uh, by vision or duality vision is very interesting because you can look through the material, through the facade with the lighting inside and you can see also all the reflection. And sometime again, this effect was not designed at all. I mean, we designed the inner effect because we could master it. But sometimes you get some things and you get really surprised at the result. Uh, this was a project uh, we, we did uh, two, three years ago. This city is one of the biggest cities of the world, if not the biggest one. It's 34 million people living in Chongqing. Um, not many people know about this city, but uh, it is one of the biggest in the world. You can go on the internet and have a look to Chongqing. It's really an amazing city with 20,000 buildings, high buildings, skyscrapers. It's a lot. It's really a lot. And uh, there was lighting everywhere in the city when we arrived there. There was laser beams and laser shows and um, LEDs everywhere on the banks, uh, on the boats, on the buildings. And uh, well, we were asked to improve this lighting because they thought it was not enough. So. <laughs> was a strange demand and we said maybe we could shut off lighting and uh, stop all that and try to see things differently but they did not appreciate our sense of humor <laughs> and uh, well we handle uh, proposing to forget about the building because 20,000 high skyscraper was not something really wanted to light so it's why we propose to really just point out the buildings and we propose to focus on the infrastructure, crazy infrastructure that was directly constructed into the water, put into the rivers and uh, just deal with this uh, amazing infrastructure landscape that is really for us contemporary and modern and uh, not deal with the building and architecture. Well, we did not like that so we never realized this project. So. <laughs> But uh, don't worry, we did realize some projects in China, and I will show them to you later on. Um, also, sometime a monument and a historical building, we, we are asked to do things differently. That was the case for this museum, because it was a museum. The, the proprietary and conservator, <coughs> curator of the museum asked us to do something totally different to attract people, so we could really light uh, official historical heritage building on a different way, playing with light. It's again a dynamic lighting. 
and we we managed to mix to combine uh, I would say traditional way of lighting a heritage building and a modern way of uh, almost painting the building with some colored light. Uh, we did the same here. We, we really wanted to use light, and especially LEDs, uh, as a painter could do. Using um, straw of colors, using uh, ink of colors, not doing a uniform lighting, not doing a lighting that will cover the architecture, but playing with lighting as a painter would play on, on a canvas. And um, we, we had to redesign the projectors to modify the colors of the LEDs. It was very difficult to find the good colors of LEDs. This is the problem we have now. When LEDs started, everyone is talking about LEDs. When LEDs started to be on the market, um, the marketing, the manager promised us to have millions of colors. And uh, we were so lucky to hear that because uh, with the classical lamps, we did not have much colors to use. So when they, they told us that it would be millions of colors, we were like uh, kids into uh, uh, toy shops, you know. And uh, well, it ends now because of uh, business restriction to five colors. So you get two blue, one green, one red, one amber, and three or four white. And that's about it. You don't have a purple, you don't have a yellow, you don't have even a yellow. You cannot get a yellow. It's, I mean, you ask just for a yellow color, it's not something too, too weird, you know? <laughs> no one will sell you LEDs that are yellow or LEDs that are purple. So in this case, we really wanted yellow. So we had to take a white LED and put some filter in front of it to get a yellow color. The old way. We used to do that. When we started, we used filters a lot, filters from theater or movie, and uh, we have to redo that again. So, problem with technology and evolution of technology is really uh, that they don't are designed or thought for design purpose. So, very often in this profession, you have to reconsider the techniques, rethink the techniques, and and try you know, in a way or another to use things or, or to use in a wrong way things to fulfill your expectation. And it makes this profession as well very interesting because you, you cannot get bored, you know, you have always to, to be creative and imaginative to fulfill your expectation. And this last project we just finished a couple of months ago. We use again natural light. We were asked by the architect to, to design this glass roof, he said to us, uh, fortunately enough, okay, I, I leave that to you. You will design the glass roof. I just wanted that this roof would be able to animate the space, to color the space, to change the perception of the space. So we use dichroic glasses that are the capacity and the, the possibility of transforming the color of the sun. And we had to calculate the position of the sun, the way the sun rays will go into the space at which period of the year, and so on and so on. And we decided where the dichroic glass would be put into this roof. And we, cha we, we choose the dichroic glass in order to get a range of colors and in order to get a modification of the colors into the space depending on the position of the sun and the trajectory of the sun, and depending as well of the possibilities of the vision from the people getting into the building. So all this for just decorative purpose. So that was a really a great challenge. There was no, no demand to do that for any functional purpose, just to animate the space that was totally white, if, if not with this uh, glass roof. And we decided also to do the interior lighting, getting all the projector outside the roof and above the roof in order to make the, the space as clean as possible without any possibility to see the projectors. So when you get into the space, the light comes through the roof, you don't know where are the projectors, and because the projector go through the dichroic glass, they transform also totally the lighting, and the, the effect during daytime and nighttime is really interesting and really nice. So, uh, after all this project, that really gave us uh, uh, confidence in making project. I will go back to the topic of uh, 
this lecture. And I will show you this uh, river we started to light in 1988. So that was our first project. So that was a competition, luckily enough. The mayor asked three to four persons to, to propose something for this river. And he asked us if we could light the river. That was uh, the demand. It was very strange, but uh, the demand was to light the river. And uh, he did not know how to do that, but he really wanted to make something strange and something different because this river, no one was going at night near the river. Everyone was afraid there was no lighting near the river. And this river is really a river that is close to a swamp, very, very famous swamp, the Marais Poit de Vin. And uh, in a way or another, the mayor wanted to relate the river to the swamp landscape at night as well as daytime because of tourism and, and the development of uh, tourists at night. So uh, we proposed to, to use uh, the vocabulary of the swamp, water lilies and, and um, vegetations of the swamp, and to transform it into lighting system. And also we propose to use the lighting as a way to structure the landscape at night. Uh, with this vocabulary of uh, luminous element, we propose to make relationship between the island and the banks and also to help people to understand how the landscape could be perceived and how the landscape could be uh, crossed or uh, walked at night. And uh, it's how we, we won this competition because the mayor thought that this idea of using the vocabulary of the swamp vegetation could be very interesting at night and it would be also in relation with uh, the daytime vision of uh, the site. And uh, well, he gave us the project and uh, he said to us, uh, okay, let's do it and uh, let's do it on one kilometer and um, make me dream. And uh, well, since that period, I never heard again a mayor ask me to make a dream. So that was really something because uh, there was no question of budget, no question of anything, no programs. And now we have to face so many, many constraints and so many rules that um, this period, this gold period is totally finished. So we did a project, we did all the buildings around related to the water perception. We create all this luminous element that goes underwater and on the banks. Uh, we had to, to define and to design everything. Everything was specially designed. Um, we had to do underwater installation. Fortunately, we were helped by the firemen that were able to, to dive and to go underwater into the bed of the river to install everything, so that was something. We worked a lot with the technicians of the cities. They were very, very proud of this project because they used to just change lamps of the public lighting and it was something totally new for them. And we realized 600 meters, uh, not one kilometer, but uh, that was a really interesting project. There was no, uh, at that period, there was no at all any consciousness of uh, if lighting could harm fishes, for example, or birds. There was no question about preservation of biodiversity, no question of light pollution. We were totally free to do what we wanted. We, we had to be ourselves aware of uh, not harming any, any animals into the river or not harming the, the, the fishes, at least the little fishes. So the project was realized, uh, and as I said at the beginning, it lasts for 10 years only because there was a huge storm in 1998, 10 years after, and the storm destroyed totally thousands thousands of trees that were drowning into the river and, and drive by the rivers, and they broke everything. So this project is not able to be seen again, but at least it started um, and lasted for 10 years, and it was very interesting. Uh, we use a lot of uh, optical laws, but most of you should know, like refraction laws and reflection laws. And, and uh, it was very interesting to transform these laws into aesthetic effect and artistic effect. Like for example, here, uh, the water lilies looks floating on the surface, but in real, they are fixed 40 centimeters under the surface. And because of the refraction law, you have the illusion that the water lily is floating and is not a 
floating at all, it's just fixed under the water level. We had to create some uh, detector to uh, know better the, the level of the water because this has many rivers, uh, level of water changed depending on season and depending on the rains. And we didn't want to have uh, the projectors that would work without water on it for aesthetic reason, but also for technical reason, because um, at that period we used the halogen lamps that were um, refreshed by the water. And uh, if the projector was out of the river, it would have been burned and would have been destroyed. So we had to create a lot of sensors and detectors to stop the lighting if any condition were not there. <coughs> then we did another project of lighting into a river uh, that was in 2003. <coughs> we did this lighting master plan for the city of Toulouse. And one of the main topics was um, lighting the river. We proposed that to the mayor. And uh, we won this competition because of his proposition, because he really wanted something into the river. He wanted to create, um, uh, in a well and over, a landscape at night that would show the importance of the river in Toulouse, and also that could also symbolize the new strategy of, uh, of the mayor that was developing the district that is in front of uh, the old part of the city. You have in Toulouse all the historical city that is from Middle Age to 17th, 18th century construction on this part on the right side of the Garonne River that flows this way all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, and all this district is 19th century, very poor, in very bad condition. So the mayor wanted to develop that part to create a new development, a new strategy, and not to be only on development on historical parts. So what we proposed, it's up there. And in a way, we told him that um, this link, this luminous link, could show that there was a decision to cross the river and to develop the other bank. So we proposed to work on this causeway of this dam and to create a luminous line totally integrated into the dam. So at night, it would develop a special image and a special nightscape with the river. Um, the length was um, 247 meters long. It was quite a long length. And we decided to create this line not continuously. That was the first time we used LEDs into this kind of project. We had to develop again all the fixture and make prototypes. And the condition of the site was quite strong and quite difficult because it's a torrential river. It comes from the Pyrenees mountains. So depending on the season, you have uh, low and, and shallow waters or very, very strong water and uh, very strong river flux. So for us, we had also to integrate that into the design. It was nothing to do with the project that I showed you before, because uh, the weather condition was really strong. And since the very beginning, we have to think about it. And now we could integrate our, our fixtures and installation to this project. Uh, so the idea was to be not continuous. Uh, first, because um, we didn't know how long LEDs fixture will work, so we wanted to have something that uh, would be discontinuous in order to accept if fixture will not work anymore. And uh, the idea was also to make it uh, not totally, uh, I would say, uh, rigid and totally continuous as something totally artificial. We really wanted to make it like if it was already destroyed a little bit and uh, make a vision of something that is not really brand new, but in a way or another has been there for ages and is already starting to be destroyed. So we designed the fixture, a special fixture. We, we had to work with many companies. We asked six companies to, to answer our program and our uh, expectation and only one succeeded. All the five others declined at the end because they were not able to construct this product. We had to design it with LEDs and the, the main difficulty was that each product could not um, consume more than two watts. 
because of, well, I, I won't go into detail because um, this um, product was uh, 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 electrified with low voltage cables, so there, there is a relation between the, the wattage and the low voltage and the diameter of the cable. And if we had product, because there were, there were a lot of products into the river, if you have product with a very, very high wattage, we needed cables that were so huge that almost all the river would have been filled with the cables. So we had to have um, very, very low wattage and we succeeded with two watt by, by each product. And uh, we needed a very important luminous effect. So we were so worried about the luminous effect that we decided to make a test. We do a lot of tests in our profession and it's a very good thing. It's one of the best moments we can have is going on the site at night and try things. And sometimes you get really afraid of the result and sometimes you get uh, more peaceful after you make this test and sometimes you have to go back to the office to work again. <laughs> so we did this test and we, we saw the luminous effect from close up to two, three meters all the way to 50, 80 meters and um, well we were really pleased with the result because we knew if with two projectors, two fixtures, we will be able to see the line at a 80 meters large. We will fulfill the expectation and we will succeed to make a project with a very, very good result. Because the, I don't know for architects or landscape architect what is, uh, I would say, the main nightmare. But for a lighting designer, at least for me, one of the main nightmares is uh, when I'm going to put on the light on a project and everyone will ask, when do you going to put on the light? Because no one sees what you realize. Mm -hmm. Especially working on landscape, everyone is making pressure on you, say, you sure we're going to see that? You sure you're going to see the light into the river? Because you make a nice computer rendering with Photoshop, but are you sure someone will see that? Because I'm going to spend a lot of money on it. So. This is kind of nightmare we have, and uh, well, sometimes you say, oh my God, if I, I put on the light and no one can see anything, what's going to happen? I'm going to be killed, and uh, I'll have to suicide myself, Arakiri, and uh, so it's, it's very, very complicated, and when you do this kind of test, at least you, you feel better, and you, you can be sure that someone will see something unless he, he has a very, very bad vision. So, prototype also helped us to understand uh, the water condition and the chemical um, deterioration of uh, the fixture because water is not as clean as possible when you deal with a big, big river like that. So we, we also uh, use the prototype to understand better uh, the lifetime of the product and how it will evolve during the, the time. And we realized the project uh, we had to make a construction work uh, during the low water season. We were not very happy because, as you can see, we had a lot, a lot of flood. Uh, 17 days of uh, very heavy and strong rain during summertime. 2005 was really a bad year to do this kind of work. So we had to evacuate the work and to, to go back to the banks and wait until the flood was off. But well, we succeed. We had also to, to test every single fixture every day to be sure that it would be working because we could not go back to the installation after we finished the work because then the flow will go up and uh, there will be no access at all to the dam until you wait to the next summer. So we had to test every single fixture when they were arriving from the trucks, we had to test them while putting them into the dam, and we had to test them every day at the end of the day to be sure that uh, what has been done in terms of electrical wiring will work. So it was a very complex approach. But we succeeded to do that. Uh, energy consumption was really, really low. It's uh, 900 watts, it's very, very little consumption for such a large project because it's uh, 247 meters long. And, uh, well, people could see the line, so that was great. When we put it on, <laughs> well, we tried the night before, to be sure. 
But still, when the mayor went on a on the red button, we call it the red button. There is no red button, but they, they love to think that there is a red button. So we say push the red button and everything will be on. <laughs> Normally, we are with phone cells saying, hey, come on, put it on, put it on. <laughs> But still, they like to push a red button, and uh, everyone could see this line, and everyone were happy. And then uh, we were very pleased to go far away and make pictures, and and to be sure that line could be seen from very far away for such a low energy consumption. 900 watts is really nothing. If you are used to iron, your um, your clothes, an iron is uh, 1,200 watts. If you get an average one, and if you have very good iron, it's 2,000 watts. So 900 watts is really almost nothing. And even with the moon, you can still see the line. And uh, even with the lighting of the bridges behind, you can still see the line. So that was a project really that fulfilled our expectation. And uh, we we're so pleased with this project. For us, it was one of the most challenging projects we never realized. And uh, for the mayor, it was something really totally new. And uh, he supported us all along this project. And what I like about it, it's, there is nothing to do with dynamic lighting. It just changes and moves depending on the water condition. So it's even better because it's a natural dynamic lighting. When the water is high, the, um, the, the image and the way you look to the lighting is really blurred. And when the water is low and shallow, the lighting and the line is really visible and very sharp. So it totally changes depending on the season. And uh, many people ask why there is this line into the river, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's just a poetic uh, landscape, and people, a lot of people come just to look at it and to sit there and to, to have the pleasure to look at it. And it doesn't harm any fishes. We had to make a, a big, big uh, uh, survey to understand what were the fishes into this river and how the fishes could be harmed or not by the lighting. Because at that period, 2005, we had a new law in France that was called the water law. And this water law uh, obliged us to make um, a study of the impact of the lighting into the natural environment for the, the animals or for the vegetation. And uh, so we work with biologists. And uh, fortunately enough, they, they help us to pick up and choose the right um, radiation, the right color. Uh, these biologists were working on uh, cells in the brain of uh, animals that are called cryptochromous, cells that react and that are codified with colors. And um, they told us that this um, cyan color that is 510 nanometer will be perfect and will not harm at all the fishes because it's a color that doesn't stress at all the fishes. So we were very pleased to hear that. Even there is no much fishes passing the dam because the dam, as you have seen, is four, four meters high. So fishes goes through the dam very quickly in even less than one second. But still, we had to prove that um, during this little, little time, no fishes will be totally stressed or hard or will have a flash of light that will give him a lot of problems in the fish life. So that was uh, the idea. We, we developed that. We, with the help of the biologists, we could prove that. We prove also that this will not damage uh, any birds or any vegetation, because there was no vegetation at all into uh, the river or on the dam. And uh, well, after a year of study, we got the full approval from the Water Law Commission. And uh, we started to make the project, and we realized it. And really, it's a project that is uh, exemplary about how light could be dealt even in a strange way with uh, respect of uh, nocturnal biodiversity. So this is a picture I got from a photograph from Toulouse. That's, he sent it back to me saying he really liked to go there and make pictures and he offered me the pictures. So. Okay, so uh, next project I want to talk about because it's also for me very important into this uh, relationship between lighting and landscape. It's a very large and big infrastructure. Uh, we were asked to work on this bridge, which is one of the longest bridge in the world. It's 2.5 kilometers. And uh, I want to also to explain you 
how sometimes as lighting designer we have to work because we receive these two images for our computer rendering and that was about it and the client was a constructor of the bridge say okay this is a competition you get the two images make a proposal <laughs> <laughs> so we have to tell what would be our intention on that and what would be the fee and what would be uh, the budget for the project so I was so surprised because as you can see it's very difficult to have any idea of what this bridge will look like at the end and uh, it was very difficult for us to understand so I decided to write a poem about darkness and uh, I, write a po I wrote a poem of 20 lines about darkness and uh, the current gulf and uh, the sea in Greece and the sky in Greece at night and the stars and so and uh, and I sang it the, the poem and uh, well they called me back and they say okay you are the winner <laughs> and I say why am I the winner I just sent you a poem and they say well a lot of people talk about techniques and uh, how they will handle the lighting and what would be the level of lighting there and so and we thought uh, maybe we better to work with someone who will send a poem because at least it make things happen and we could have a dialogue and start to dialogue together. So I was very surprised and we won this competition with this little poem and then we started to make the work. And we did not have much material to work on, we had to imagine everything. So we started to make rendering on the rendering. So if you can see this rendering here with the bridge, okay, and this is the same rendering we did at night. We had no idea at all of how we're going to do this lighting, but at least we knew what we wanted. We wanted a line, a golden thread, we call it, and we wanted these pylons that are 185 meters high to be blue, and we call them the blue needles. And uh, we proposed to throw this uh, golden thread through the blue needle. We did not want any lighting under the bridge level. This is 60 meters high to the sea level. We wanted to use the reflection. We wanted to create a, a strange uh, vision on the bridge. And why this? Because um, the idea for us, because this is a, a seismic region, there is a tectonic uh, uh, condition and um, island of um, Peloponnese is uh, living and lifting from the continent of Greece. Every year, one centimeter and a half, the Peloponnese island is getting away of the Greek continent. So we thought that with this uh, golden line, we might be able to help them to hold it a little bit like, a, like an elastic. So that was the idea. We thought that if we could create something that would be really as virtual as possible, it might be interesting. So we started to work. Uh, we're starting to do more co more computer rendering. We wanted to play with shadows. We had no material to work on that, so we made a model um, in with paperboard. Uh, we started to do some lighting. We we choose some little projectors that were exactly in the same scale that the big one we wanted. It was one for five, and we did construct a model that was one for five on the bridge and we started to play with the lighting and see if we could project the shadows. And uh, we, we proposed to the client to do that and to, to realize this um, golden thread. So then start, the construction started. We were not able to go there and make some trial and test because uh, it was impossible to get onto the pylons. So we had to wait until the bridge was totally finished to make the first test. And we have to imagine everything because we had to define and make the studies and detailed studies for all the projectors. We have to order all the projectors in order to be uh, ready for the opening of the bridge because the opening of the bridge was for the start of the Olympic Games and um, the Olympics um, runners were supposed to cross the bridge and to open the bridge. So we had to work totally virtually and uh, <laughs> we, we were again very, very afraid of uh, what would be the result. We made a lot of calculation, we had a lot of nightmares again. And uh, finally we made some tests and uh, we reached with the test, the first test on the first pylon, 
uh, help us to define exactly uh, the number of projectors, but also the, the quantity of light we could have and how the light will go on the pylon and so on and so on. And for the little story and to understand how sometimes it's difficult to be understood, um, at one moment during the construction of the bridge, the project manager of the bridge called us and said, we just decided the painting on the bridge uh, and we wanted to let you know that you're going to be blue. And I said, well, we're supposed to make a golden thread. <laughs> so if you paint it in blue, it's impossible. It's no, well, with lighting, you will be able to do whatever you want, you know? You just make it, make it gold, no problem. <laughs> and I said, well, it's not possible. If the, if the bridge is blue, well, we can make it gray or dark or, or black or not lighted or blue. But no way we could transform a blue color into a yellow gold color. And he said, you sure? Because we do a lot of things here with bridges and uh, we don't have any problems. And I said, okay, try and you call me back. <laughs> and they tried for two days. They took some projectors and some filters and some lamps and they tried and they tried and they tried. After two days, they called me back and they said, okay, you're right. We cannot make it go. <laughs> And then they say, what shall we do? I say, well, you just paint in yellow. <laughs> this is very easy. And they say, no, but it's impossible because uh, the yellow color is forbidden for bridges. They are not uh, with the norms. And uh, we have to make a process of development of a special painting. And it would take a lot of time. I say, well, this is your problem. You asked me to do what I thought it would be good to do. And now it's your problem. So they, they went all the way through that. They were very, very fair. And uh, while well, they painted all this bridge in, in yellow. And uh, for the funny things, the end of the story was uh, we came to make the first test to, to see exactly the position and how the, the projectors will create the shadows we wanted to create. And uh, at what point of the project we asked to use uh, yellow filters, but we did, were not sure if we needed yellow filters because we, we did not know exactly the color of the painting. But uh, they bought this yellow filter, they installed it, and the first day we went there to make the try and the test, we arrived at night because our plane were late, and when we arrived it was already night, so we could not see much of the thing, we just saw the lighting. We did the test, we did the setup, and uh, wow, we went back in the morning, back to France and then they call us and they say do we keep the filters the yellow filters and I say what filters are you talking about and I say well there was yellow filters on the projectors I say oh sorry but <laughs> we could not be able to see the filter because it was night and for us the light was okay but we did not know you had the filters on the projectors so they bought like 580 filters and they they were able to keep them and it makes things better, but um, we never understood that the filters were already there. So when you are in night vision and night conditions, sometimes it's very, very difficult to understand what you're doing, especially when you do some tests and you don't know exactly how things will go. But still, it was very interesting to see that um, they fulfill what we wanted and uh, they, they were really willing to do it as, as good as possible. So then we had to make, it took us two weeks to set up every single projectors. There was 540 projectors for the golden thread and there was 180 projectors for the four pylon. And uh, well, we, we finished the project, we lined up. The program was that the lighting could be seen from 10 kilometers away and as well that the lighting would not be any problem for the pedestrian on the bridge, no glare, no uncomfort, so we have to fulfill that. Um, we had also to decide the position of the projector in order that anyone could make any vandalism, and uh, we had also to do the lighting to create the shape of the, of the pylon, because in daytime, it's very obvious, you get shadows from the sun position, at night time, we really wanted to recreate, uh, in a way or another, our shadows or at least brightest faces and darker faces could exist and could create a shape. So this was very, very complicated and very interesting to, to do. And the result was very good. People were very pleased. Uh, this is a vision that you would have been without any lighting. So behind is Patras. It's one of the biggest cities of Greece here. And uh, well, a lot, a lot of light, a lot of um, light uh, 
pollution and if the bridge was not lighting it would have been a very dark silhouette like that so it was an interesting project for lighting designer that was the opening 2.5 kilometers of fireworks done by a French group, it's called Group F, one of the best ones in the world. And we were totally astonished by the firework. It lasts for 20 minutes, it was just incredible. Driving from one side to the other, back and forth. And uh, well, we did the lighting and put it on, and it's still working because this is a project that has been developed by the constructor. The constructor is in charge of um, the operation of the bridge and he gets a toll fee and also he's in charge of the maintenance. So 10 years after this project worked very well, every single projector is really well uh, maintained and really well followed. And the project is really perfect. It's one of the few projects where the maintenance is perfect because it's a private uh, owned project and the contractor really wanted and needed the projects to be perfect as much as possible. Uh, this project was interesting. I wanted to show you that because again, it's a landscape project. <clears throat> the idea was to to deal with lighting on a public space. This is the existing situation before the landscape uh, project was developed. We had a lot of um, balls like that. You all know these kind of balls that make a lot of glares and a lot of uh, light pollution. And the project was um, to renew totally the public space in order to, to make more space for the pedestrian, to lower the car circulation, and to transform totally the image of um, this very well-known waterfront in France. It's one of the best waterfront that we have in France in the city of Le Sable d'Olonne. So that was a project from the landscape arch architect. A large, large space, very smooth, very flat, dedicated mostly to pedestrian. And um, we wanted to lower as much as possible the impact of the lighting installation. So we designed poles of 14 meters high with four or five projectors in order to fulfill all the lighting expectation. And also in order to free the vision from the buildings towards the sea and towards the sky. This is the realization, so that, that was interesting because we could really work on diverse sequences and rhythms. Uh, we use all this lounge that was designed by the architect and landscape architect to make them special at night. Uh, we didn't want the uniform and continuous lighting on the promenade and the waterfront, so we really wanted something that could uh, make a spot onto the ground and not a continuous lighting. And because of uh, the new regulation, this was a 30 kilometers per hour circulation street, so we could do something without too much uniformity and with a very low level of flux, we are 10 lux level on the street, and we have the same level of light on the pedestrian. This uh, uh, principle of uh, high mast allowed us to free as much as possible the far vision from any obstacle, any vertical into the perspective and as well from the buildings in front of it to have um, as less as possible verticals into the perception of uh, the sea or perception of the sky. So that was the lighting master plan we developed. So you see the beach is really long. It's one kilometer beach, one of the beautiful one we have in the west of France. It's where they go from Vendée Globe, if you are fond of, uh, of race uh, with sails. And uh, we propose to do a white lighting without, again, any difference between street and, and pedestrian. We propose to light uh, a little bit the beach, because uh, depending on the tide, if it's low tide or high tide, you can walk very, very far away, and then you can have a look back to to the lighting installation, and the idea was with this lighting to, to in a way, um, reveal the curve of the beach or reveal the curve of the waterfront, and also to construct a nightscape that will show the relationship between the city and the beach and and the sea. So this is uh, the first phase realized. You can compare. This is the existing situation with a lot, a lot of glares coming from the balls. 
and this is the first phase of works without any glare, any lighting going upward, and uh, from far away, not at all any disturbance from the far vision. We had to set up every single projector again. It was not like a, a usual street lighting project. We also wanted to enhance some, some trees and these lounges, what we call lounges. We changed sometimes the um, tonality of light. This is a, a salmon color we created in some spaces related to the facade colors and related to the ambience we wanted to create. And all this blue needle with our little with LEDs will really design the curve of the beach. And we also made a blue light to make people understand where you can go down because there is quite a high wall that is five, six meters high. So people can go down on the stairways when it's a blue color. So it helps also people to understand where are the, the, the site and where are the stairways into this one kilometer long project. So this is some of the ambiences you can find. So you, you see how you can really draw the waterfront just with the blue needles and projectors. This is one thing it's important to understand, it's how lighting can really construct a landscape totally in a different way at night. Because on daytime you see only the buildings, you see all the waterfronts, but you see the buildings. The buildings disappear totally at night because we didn't want to light them, it's all residential buildings. The people there are there for resting and be peaceful. They didn't want anything but both of them. So we reconstruct with this virtual lighting, we reconstruct a curve and we reconstruct a nightscape. And we put this nightscape in front of the existing waterfront. And in this way, we show this relation between the waterfront and the sea. We use a lot of different uh, ambiences, sometimes pedestrian, sometimes ground recess projectors. And as I said, we, we deal with these lounges. We try to make them attractive and uh, welcoming. We work with the architect and landscape architect on the benches to integrate lighting on, on the little structure to integrate lighting. And we lighted all the stairways that goes down, sometimes there is restaurant in front of it and bars. And this is a lighting we did also on a wall to, to light the beach. One of the projectors dedicated to the beach, and then we have these little projectors that can be stayed and, uh, during the winter season. Even if there is a high tide and there is tempest, these projectors are very well protected. They are IP68 with LEDs, so we don't need to remove them during winter season. They can stay there all years. Before, they used to put some projectors every single summer season and take them away in October because they could not stay there because there was not good protection enough. And with LEDs and uh, very good uh, indices of protection, now they can really stay there. So the technician really uh, thanks us to help them to make the maintenance and not to have to change everything every single year. And this is a vision from far away. If you go far away on low tide, you can see all the beach and you can see also on the curve. So the, the masts are in wood. This is not very uh, <coughs> frequent. We have 14 meters high mast totally in wood. And then we have a metal uh, fixation for the projectors and a metal base for the mast. This is during Christmas season. They put on, on this mask, they put uh, speakers and uh, Christmas decoration and uh, kakemono as well. And uh, well, nowadays masks are something that uh, really are able to accept a lot, a lot of crazy thing onto it. But uh, so you have, when you make a design, be sure that they will use your mask in a way you never thought about it. So make design as simple as possible so you can accept a lot of crazy things onto it. Um, 
now we're going to change scale and go on a very, very large scale city scale because uh, I wanted to show you how we deal with light on a very large scale. And the first project I wanted to explain, it's a study we, we did. It's a light master plan for the city of Sao Paulo. It's the largest light master plan we did so far. Sao Paulo, it's a city of 12 million people. And we were asked to, to in a world and over, to help all the people working for the city with this lighting strategy because it's a very complicated city. If you count uh, the metropolitan area of Sao Paulo is 24 million people, so it's a really, really large scale. But in this case, I will present you only this topic of uh, what we call ghost landscape because it's a very special topic and I, I didn't want to explain the full light semester plan because it took us a year and a half to develop and to study it and it would be way too long to explain it now. So what is this ghost landscape? Let's try to understand. Some little uh, data about Sao Paulo, 670,000 luminous point, one luminous point for 18 person living there. Um, it's very important to get this ratio into your mind if you want to deal with lighting strategy because um, the way of defining the number of luminous points for people living in a city, it's in a way or another a really good tool to understand the economic development and uh, how the city is dealing with a high quality of lighting because uh, many, many cities have, um, if they are in very well development countries, they will have a number of luminous points according to few people living in the city. If you go to cities or countries that are very, very poor, you will have luminous point for a lot, a lot of people living into the city. If you compare, for example, Paris and uh, Abidjan, that is in Ivory Coast, uh, in Paris, 12 people will share one luminous point, one public lighting luminous point. It's already much better than Sao Paulo. It was 18 in Sao Paulo. But if you go to African city like Abidjan, you will have 95% sharing one luminous point. So that means they don't have much public lighting into the streets. Very often it's totally dark there. It's not able to go at night unless you have a car with uh, car lights. If you go to Bamako, which is even a poorest country, Bamako, it's 145 persons that share one luminous point. Bamako is Mali, capital of Mali, one of the poorest countries in the world, and uh, 145 persons will share one luminous point. So this is, in a way and over, a very interesting tool to understand the economic development of a city, and we use it a lot as models to understand what is a development, what is a quality of lighting, because very often all this is relating to uh, the way the lighting has been constructed, the so quality of lighting, and also for sure, which kind of lighting, if it's a functional lighting, how it's been built. And again, the energy consumption is a very important asset. If you compare Paris, with is 150 gigawatt -er, and uh, Sao Paulo with 600 gigawatt -er, you can really understand that uh, the way the city is dealing with energy consumption is really bad. They don't have many luminous points, but they spend a lot, a lot, a lot of electricity. In the opposite, in Paris, the quality of lighting is really high, and the energy consumption is still high, but at least is a much better use of energy consumption than in Sao Paulo. As a matter of fact, Paris has a climate plan now, and uh, we are dealing with the strategy of lighting with Paris as well. And up to 2020, we will need to lower the energy consumption of 30%. That means 2020, the energy consumption of the public lighting will need to be 100 gigawatt -er only and not anymore 150 gigawatt. -er. So it's a huge challenge. And we're developing a new way of lighting the city, lowering the level of flux, and doing very, very interesting, uh, innovative uh, solution. But coming back to Sao Paulo, <coughs> we understood that Sao Paulo was something very special, so we really wanted to, with the lighting, to help the authorities to develop, in a way or another, a dialogue between the city and the landscape. So. 
you have the sea here. This is uh, Atlantic Ocean. All the city goes now all the way to the sea with the harbor of Sao Paulo that is 30 kilometers away. And um, if we look to the growth of the city, you have the growth of the city since the very beginning up to now. That is really usual for megalopolis. The growth is incredible. It started from a little village at the cross of the river. Started here. Oops, sorry. Started here. And then you see now, this is the limits of Sao Paulo with all the river system that has been totally uh, hided. Slowly and slowly, I, I will show it to you. Uh, this again was how it was at the start. Indian village with nothing, little river, canoes. And then they started, as mine does very often, to construct the landscape in order to be able to develop the city. They did not use the landscape as we try to do now to integrate or to have an intimate relationship between the landscape and the city. They just build the landscape or rebuild the landscape in order to build the city. So, for example, they rectified, as they say, the river. The river was going like that. They thought it was not good for developing infrastructure and building, and so, so they rectified it and make it like that. And uh, they also changed uh, the current of the river. This is the only place in the world where they changed the current. The, the river was uh, flowing from north to south. They thought it was not easy because of uh, the topographic reason, and also there was lakes in this part. So they decided to make huge pumps and to reverse the current, and they did it on two, three kilometers. And now the river is going from south to north. It's much easier for a lot of development of the city. And then they started to construct the city without any relationship with the water. They dig all the rivers, the little rivers. They put them underground, and they cover everything with infrastructure and with buildings. And the development started with a lot, a lot, a lot of construction. <coughs> As you can see, this is a picture from the 50s, 1950s. And uh, already a lot, a lot of skyscrapers <coughs> and buildings. There is 2,000 towers in, in the center city of Sao Paulo. So it gives you an idea of the number of towers. I don't know in Milano. In Paris, we have one. And we are constructing the second one. It took us 10 years of debate to construct the second tower. And uh, they have 2,000 in Sao Paulo and 20,000 in Chongqing. And so sometimes making comparison is quite uh, frightening. No? So you see, all these were a river. This is, was a river. Now it's a, one of the largest <coughs> avenues. It's called uh, 23 de Mayo. And uh, there is a huge number of lanes and traffic jam. Take five hours to go from north to south. Almost impossible to cross the city. And well, landscape has totally disappeared. It's quite impossible to know where is the landscape, where was the river, only if you know that the rivers were built, uh, that infrastructure and big highways were built over river, you can understand it a little bit. So you have to go 30 kilometers away just to find again the landscape and to get a relationship between the nature and the city. So for us, it was quite incredible way of looking to a city and uh, incredible perception of the city environment and the, I would say the negative aspect of uh, this relation between the site and the city. At night also was very interesting to analyze. Everything was lighted with uh, high pressure sodium high mass, and unless here, this is historical, this is the only part of Sao Paulo where you can find pedestrian lighting with the cathedral. And then everywhere else, it's only street lighting with a high mast, 80 meters high. And then, even if they use high mast, when you are not in the city center, you get a lot of darkness because they don't want to develop any lighting for many, many districts. They think that pedestrian has no importance at all, and only cars should be really treated well with lighting. So when you are on a car in a traffic jam, stuck in a traffic jam, you have a very good lighting, high pressure sodium, high level of light. If you are a pedestrian, this is an adventure. 
forget about it. You have to cross crazy infrastructure, no lighting at all. So people take uh, buses or subway and they don't try to walk into the city. Everyone tells you don't walk in Sao Paulo because first it's dangerous, secondly it's impossible to find your way, and third if you go at night is you are really crazy, so don't walk. And well, really the impression and the ambience are very, very difficult for pedestrians. And this is the last uh, infrastructure they created, the bridge, new, brand new bridge, and they decided to light it. So I was against uh, illumination totally dedicated to, to streets and cars, because there is no pedestrian here. You are not allowed as a pedestrian to take the bridge and cross it. It's just dedicated to cars on a high speed level. And as you can see, all the infrastructure along the rivers are very well lit, and then there is nothing for pedestrian. So, what was the idea of um, this light semester plan? We really wanted what we call revealing the ghost landscape. So everyone asked us what was the meaning of that. And we tried to explain to the authorities that uh, all this network of rivers that disappeared. So you see now the street at night with the lighting and uh, the river that are still existing. And you can understand if you know a little bit of geography and topography and landscape, but this used to be all the rivers going to the main rivers. So we thought that maybe with lighting we would be able to show that. So we proposed to color the light of the public lighting when you were on a street that were above, constructed above a river. And in this way, on another, give a little relationship between the old system of rivers and the new system of street network. So we did this kind of maps to explain that, explaining that we could in a way rediscover this network and rediscover how the river were constructed into Sao Paulo at the beginning and how we lost this relationship because all these rivers are dig underwater. We propose to light the banks and to light the promenade near the river, even if no one goes there. But we thought that lighting could be a start of a new strategy of urbanization, that lighting could, in a way or another, make people more interested into their natural environment and uh, into their vision of rivers, to maybe to care a little bit the rivers, but um, no one look at it because they can not go near to it or whatever. And even when they are channel river, we propose to light them. This is a subway in viaduct. We propose to light them just to attract attention because no one never looked to this channel river, and we thought lighting would be a very good tool to do it. And then for the city center, as you can see on this map, this was the river that were existing at one time. They don't exist anymore. Everything has been buried and put underground. There is no water at all. And they have a lot of problems of flood and problem of pollution and so on. And with the lighting again, we say that maybe in a way or another, we could symbolize or reveal this ghost landscape and try to create a lighting that we talk about the river, that we talk about the uh, current of a river with projection, with colors, with an a one and over, making an ambience that has nothing to do. You have the existing situation here and what we propose. Because the river was flowing under here. And uh, we, we do think that uh, creating this relationship between this ghost landscape and the existing situation is uh, really a way to create a dialogue between citizen and environment. Because um, if you born in Sao Paulo and live in Sao Paulo, you never heard about uh, this historical water system. You don't know at all what was the landscape before the city was constructed. And how could you care with the environment? How could you develop an intimate relationship with the environment if you have no idea at all that you are on a landscape that existed at one point and that does not exist anymore. So for us, it's very important to go on creating this new link and maybe making things different and having people looking as highway. This is uh, 25 de Mayo, 25 de Mayo. That was a big, big infrastructure with traffic jam. 
and making making it with flight at its it is still a big river. So to finish with, I will show you um, a study we just finished a year ago. And uh, we decided to make a large study and large um, inquiry about darkness and how we could rediscover darkness into a city. <coughs> We call it uh, the dark infrastructure, too much green infrastructure and blue infrastructure to add a layer on um, city strategy and city development with green, blue, and dark infrastructure. That means thinking of how darkness could be reinstalled into city environment, how darkness could be preserved and developed into city environment. So this lighting master plan and this dark infrastructure has been totally approved by the municipal authority. And now we are detailing it and, and uh, developing it for um, real try on site. So what is all about, again, there was like in many cities, <coughs> light pollution in rain. You get again the, all the data here. You need to be very, if you are really interested by lighting and uh, city lighting and lighting master plan, these data are very helpful. and. Uh, make you understand very quickly how works uh, lighting installation in the city. Uh, you can see that they are very efficient. It's only 124 watt per luminous point. Uh, Paris is uh, 185, so that means they are very good and already with a very low energy consumption. But still there is a lot of uh, light pollution. They have the chance to have an urbanization that is very famous in France because it has been contained into the limit of the city. The, the limits between the city and the landscape around all agricultural fields is really a large contrast. This has been a policy, a public policy to contain the urbanization, to not develop the urbanization, to not spread the urbanization. You, you might know that uh, this is a big problem for many cities, how to contain the urbanization, not to spread it all over. And um, we thought that this would be a very interesting uh, thing to develop into darkness. So we studied the dark environment. We had the chance that the all the ring around was not lighted, only the crossing were lighting, and a lot of uh, commercial area and facade were lighting, but uh, for us it was important to keep this ring into darkness and not to light it at all. This is the existing situation with a very, very good dark condition on uh, the ring when you drive on the ring, and then on some crossing, and if you are front of uh, commercial areas, you get a lot of lighting. So starting from that, we also analyzed where were the existing lighting that was damaging the natural zones. As you can see, light pollution is getting very, very high in some sensible and natural zones. In some others, fortunately enough, we have a very, very good dark condition. So it was, a, in a way, another way to not only analyze, but uh, inventory uh, the dark condition and the site that would be very good at night uh, in terms of uh, photosensitivity and relationship between the night and, and the urban environment. And then, uh, fortunately, we had a deputy mayor that was very clever and very bright, and he asked us uh, if we could turn off most of the light. So we said, calm down, we're not going to turn off every light, because it would be very difficult to put it on and put it off again if people think it's a problem. So we, we developed this dark infrastructure working on a green belt and using the green belt as a scheme and as a, a grid for the dark infrastructure. We also use all the railways as a dark infrastructure and all the rivers and the banks as a part of the dark infrastructure. We propose to create what we call dark corridors following the biological corridors, keeping into darkness all the surroundings and the edges of the city. And we really wanted to preserve the human activity, so it was important to not uh, do any harm to the suburbs area or peripheral area without any lighting. So it was important to contain the darkness 
in two zones where there is no one living or no one having uh, night activities. And we propose also to imagine how we could share the darkness. So there was something strange for the authorities to say, what do you mean by sharing the darkness? So we thought that in many, this is, all these blue dots are 40% of the territory of France. So it's a lot, a lot of territory. This is a campus, a huge campus. <clears throat> this is um, uh, office zone. This is industrial zone. This one as well is industrial zone. This is hospital zone. This is commercial area, commercial area. So the idea was to understand and to uh, investigate the period of night where people was working or moving or dealing with activities and then creating a kind of um, stock exchange so people could share the darkness. Like if you are in an industrial zone and you think you can put off the light at 8 o'clock in the night, well, in a world lover you get some, um, some points and then you are able to develop lightings differently in over period of night or in over period of the year. So it's like a stock exchange. The idea is really that people could participate and share the darkness and in this condition get more authorization to do things and, and this will help to construct a dark environment and fortunately enough to arrive to a point where darkness will be majority of the territory and not minority of the territory. So we have to work on that. It's, it's not as crazy as it looks but we have to make a lot of consultation, we have to make discussion with the owners, we have to study very carefully the period of activities, how it goes with the circulation and so on and so on, but I am very confident and we are already starting working in this zone up there, we are making a detailed study of zoom to this zone, and uh, well, the start is very encouraging. Then we develop special way of lighting, special technology. People could trigger the lighting with their cell phone or they, they could have a button to light it up if they go with their dog uh, on the bank to, to, to go out with the dog at night. We can just put a button like you do home and you light it at the beginning of the bank and when you get out of the bank, you put it back off and there is no lighting on the bank, or you can do it with your phone cell, or you can be detected, and uh, well, there's many, many ways now with a lot of technology to change totally the relationship between lighting and people and, and occupation of the space. And also, when you get to the natural zone and to uh, the dark belt, this lighting would be no at all permanent. There will be only if there is someone walking, when you are getting nearby, it could be both. And then for sure, in the center, inner center, it could be more permanent or at least until one o'clock, two o'clock in the night, and then get done. So we don't want to do everything the same. We don't want to have the people afraid of night or afraid of darkness. We really want to change the attitude toward the darkness and in a one another rediscover the darkness. We calculate uh, the number of interventions in terms of te technical aspect and budget aspect, and there was not much work to do. And also, we are now coordinating. There is uh, a lot, a lot of architects and landscape architects working on all these new area and renewing and developing new projects. And uh, we are working transversally with every single team to prove them that it's possible to develop this dark infrastructure and to help them for each single project to develop the dark infrastructure, helping them to find new solution for dark infrastructure. And you can see that we really want to preserve the polarities, the centralities on every single district where the centralities are very important. So to finish with, I wanted to show you briefly uh, two projects we finished in China. So the, the main, main program was to develop in nocturnal tourism. And this is interesting to finish with because this is tourism, uh, we could say landscape tourism. The, the, as you will see, the Chinese authority wanted to develop tourism on large landscape site, uh, site that are classified UNESCO for some of them and some of others. They really want that people will 
be very pleased to come to um, inside the city, but not for urban purpose only, but also to see a landscape and to see differently at night means staying at night, developing a new economy of night tourism, having people going to a restaurant and to hotels, and instead of just going by daytime, going to nighttime as well. So the first one we did in 2008 is uh, Grand Canal. This is Hangzhou. <clears throat> it's 2,000 kilometers away from Beijing. This canal has been made made. It's 1,794 kilometers long. And uh, it was very important to develop the north of China and to help the empire of uh, north China to get the power on all China. It helps also a lot to develop all the famous Great Wall because it could bring a lot of material, a lot of people, and a lot of food to people working on the Great Wall. So this is a city of Hangzhou with the Canton River. This is a canal project. The idea for the authority was to renew it and also to develop a special nightscape, a special lighting. Really, the canal was in poor condition with a lot of industry around. They decided to change totally the urbanization and to make it more appealing and more welcoming for residents as, as well for tourists. So this is some pictures. This is the culture of lighting in Nangsu before we arrived. And the mayor told us that uh, his uh, favorite city was Las Vegas and Dubai. So we thought that we won't stay much in Hangzhou and we had to come back to Paris. But fortunately, we succeeded to convince him to do it something differently. This is the existing lighting on the canal when we arrived there. Many, many different colors, many different level of light, brightness. Some banks were lighted, some banks were not lighting, some buildings were lighting, some were not. So we proposed to, to create a very artistic uh, approach, what we call Chinese wash painting, doing lighting with um, blurred effect, playing with uh, water, playing with humidity, the natural humidity into the canal. And we did the lighting master plan with the lighting on both banks. We dealt with 10 kilometers long, both banks, 50 meters large on each bank. And we lighted 21 bridges, 70 modern architectures, and more than 80 traditional architectures. What was the proposal? This idea of creating a mist of light using the humidity and using the trees and the vegetation doing frames and creating frames to hide the building because most of them were very, very ugly and we didn't want to see them at night. So with this um, luminance and these luminous frames, we were able to hide totally the buildings. We proposed to put some mast into the water that would bump and move slowly with the water level and when boats go on all along the water. We are the partner, we're working with the Chinese designers, Yang Zuan, and um, it was very interesting to exchange and to dialogue and to mix cultures because they were really attracted by uh, mythology and, and symbols of animals and they told us, for example, that the water dragon should be in a way or another integrated into the design because it protects from the flood. And it was not a way for us to think about the project, but. Uh, well, we followed them and they integrated the Watcher Dragon in the design. So no one knows really what it is, but at least they know that it is there and that um, fortunately enough the Watcher Dragon will protect from the flood. So it was very interesting. It was interesting as well for all the very usual system. They, we started from a very contemporary luminous pole and we ended with uh, Chinese style lanterns and Chinese lanterns. And, we had a lot of discussion about the colors because red lanterns, I don't know in Italy, but red lanterns in France is for a house of um, prostitutes. <laughs> and uh, maybe in Italy as well, huh? <laughs> Well, it used to be. There is no more house of prostitutes. But uh, red lantern is really a very bad symbol that people doesn't like. And in any way you could be able to put a red lantern in front of a house. But, when we propose white lantern, they said this is a symbol of death in China. So they told us that the red lantern was a symbol of prosperity and, and luck and richness. So 
we had to, you know, to understand better the culture and to rely on them because we knew nothing about the Chinese culture and uh, fortunately enough we knew a lot about it. We designed the whole waterscape uh, with a lot of uh, rhythm and sequences. We did a mock-up 400 meter long, that was the existing situation and what was the result at the end. We made a lot of consultation and uh, communication with the neighbors because the governor wanted that the neighbors approve uh, fully the project. If not, we won't realize it. And they approved it, they approved the color, they approved the brightness. Everything was dimmable, piloted by computer system. We could change a little bit of colors from very profound and deep blue to a more blue-green color. And well, Hangzhou is a city with a lot of um, warm season, 40 degrees Celsius for many months, so people wait until nights come and they go out, and because most of the apartments are very small with three generations living there, the great parents, the parents and the kids, they really appreciate to go outside and, and they really are very pleased with, with going out and just uh, social, having a social, you know, uh, way of dealing with night. They go there, they talk, they play, they play cards, they dance, they make uh, all kind of things and uh, well we did the 10 kilometers long project with very special ambiences. They created a, a float of boats, 50 boats, just to, to have the capacity of uh, going and tour the canal and developing this night tourism. They create new districts. And well, people are really happy to go there and to, to be welcoming by the lighting. So that was a very interesting challenge. And last project, it's uh, again a, a huge river project, a diversion of a river that has been man made as well. A long, long time ago, they decided to make a diversion system so the water will go through the city and uh, will be able to help the development of agriculture on a country that is almost big as France. So they cut the, the mountains here at that period with men on 50 meters large and they created a barrage at that period only with stones into the waterbed. Now there is a barrage, a dam, but at that period it was man-made and they divided the water here and they cut the mountain and they were able to have these canals and channels flowing in Sichuan plains. It has been classified UNESCO. It's an amazing project realized by uh, human creativity and uh, this city has been destroyed uh, at 80 percent by an earthquake in 2008 and they asked us to redefine totally the lighting. That was the existing lighting before the earthquake with a lot of glare, a lot of projectors, huge projectors with green filters, 1000 watts, 2000 watts, a lot of glare. They tried really to light the water but they could not succeed. They just give a lot of glare to the people walking around. So we did a lighting master plan explaining them that we should really deal on a large scale from the beginning of the Minjiang River all the way through the channels instead of just working here like they wanted at the beginning. They accepted, so we started. Then we developed a project on uh, uh, use of two colors, jade and gold colors. We made the computer renderings explaining that if we just lit the bank wall, we don't need to light the water because the water stream is very high. There is a lot of white steam, so the diffusion of the lighting here will light the steam without anything needed to, to be added. So with the rendering, they were a little bit uh, worried about the result. Again, nightmare. Does that work? <laughs> Say, yes, now we know a lot about it, so it will work, don't worry. But still, they really wanted to, to see it, so they decided to realize, and we started, and this is the result. So we just light the banks. We have a long, continuous light that is not be visible in daytime. It's dimmable, so we have the capacity to dim it as much as we want. 
and it's a jade color, a special jade color we develop with um, addition of three LEDs, one white, one green, and one yellow. And then we did all the architectural lighting with gold light, with LEDs. This is a 100% LEDs project. This kind of project now, we do it with 100% of LEDs fixtures and it gives a um, very low energy consumption. It gives the capacity to have very, very small projectors and uh, the capacity as well to be invisible in daytime because um, projectors are so small and so invisible that no one can see them. All this is street, they call it beer street, where you can drink beers and eat some shrimps, very famous. They come from the Minjang River. And uh, well, the lighting is really well appreciated because it changed totally the vision of the, the canal. We lighted the pagodas as well, as well there. And uh, they started to light the hill. We don't approve that, but they wanted to light the hill. So I think it's a mistake, but still. We finished the project a year and a half ago. We did uh, five kilometers and we're supposed to continue and go on. We lighted all the bridges from inside to outside. We developed the lanterns. And again, well, one of the best things about uh, this profession and work is uh, when people get out and uh, enjoy the lighting. And for us, is uh, really one of the best things we get back from this uh, very fantastic way of uh, dealing with light. Thank you very much. Bene, allora abbiamo assistito a questa bellissima presentazione, molto complessa, molto estesa, ma volevo chiedere al pubblico presente se ha delle domande da fare. But slowly. Slowly. <laughs> Unless Virginia is still here and translate. Okay. No, I just uh, I want to uh, know if uh, you didn't find in, the, in this world in, in the lighting with with the water uh, if you have a problem with algas. Uh, well, here in Jujangya, not at all because uh, the flow is so strong okay. that any algas will stay or remain and, uh, because it wash away everything. But in over condition, not in, in the Garon River, for yeah, example, yeah. Uh, the maintenance is supposed to be done every year at, at summertime. At yeah, okay. they come okay. and they, they okay. sweep it off, okay. and it's very easy. And for the newer project, again, we, we ask um, technician to go every summer with a bark and uh, to sweep the projectors. So everything as before the projector could be taken away and be swept. Okay. Now they don't exist anymore, but at least they used to do that. So you're right, this is a problem, especially on low low, low water or, or low or current or low stream. But well, you know, you have to It's just... It's not a real problem. Well, everything can be a problem if you don't deal with the problem. <laughs> This is like that in all profession, you know. So you have to be aware of the possible problems and find answers. And if you find good answer, they follow you. Thank you. Welcome. I thought that yellow light is more comfortable, but it's just my personal opinion. But in many cases, you, your choice was to use whiter light for pedestrian and cars altogether. Why is that? Well, uh, first because I like white light. <laughs> <laughs> and I think mm -hmm. it's one of the best light we can have into a public space because it, it gives you the opportunity to see the colors of the space, colors of the ground, colors of people, <laughs> colors of the face, colors of the clothes. The rendering is very, very good. And um, the last studies have been proved but you can lower the level of light with white light because you see much better with white light but with yellow light or orange light. So you can lower until 30% like the level of flux. And well, I think in a way or another, this white light gives um, 
a very good atmosphere around the people. So I don't like uh, orange light or sodium light because it's really poor in terms of color rendering. It's really sad and really, it gives you a bad, bad vision. Many people think, as you said, uh, it's nicer, it's more romantic, and I never found high precious sodium romantic, but maybe I'm not romantic enough, so I don't know. Probably for internal spaces, mm. I thought. Well, internal spaces, they are with halogen and now with warm white as well. This is 3000 Kelvin or 2800 Kelvin, so this is a light we use out outdoor as well. But then it's very personal, you know, so. Um, if people doesn't like the, wa the white light, well, they, they go somewhere else, you know? It's like uh, me with sodium light. I mean, I go somewhere else. I don't stay into sodium light. And can I ask something that is related? Sure. Uh, here you, you use uh, yellow light. Yeah. Gold light, not yellow light. Gold. Ah. It's not so the difference? Well, the rendering, because it's a gold light, so it's LEDs. That's uh, gold. So the rendering of the material of the roof, the pagoda roof and the buildings, it's really, really good. You can see all the details and the colors. Because, well, it's hard to explain, but the sodium lamp has a very little spectrum and uh, very few radiation that renders the colors. On LEDs, you got a lot of uh, radiation because to make a gold light, you start with a blue light and then you transform into a gold light. It's quite difficult to explain, but it works like that, believe me. And what we use here, it's a property of the eyes to saturate the colors. If you uh, give to the eyes two colors that are very far away from one from the other, like the, the cyan or blue-green color to the gold, your eyes normally will try to get the average. And in this case, it will shift the colors because you won't get the opportunity to find the medium position. So the gold will look golder and the blue-green will look much blue-green than it is in reality. So this is a very important property that Dan Flavin, the artist, used a lot. He puts you into an environment of color, then your eyes shift slowly and you think that colors has been blurred, but in, in fact the colors have been saturated your eyes and it's a very amazing sensation. But then you see totally different the colors of your environment. And uh, another property we use a lot is that um, if you look to the reception, the photo reception of the human eyes at night, the blue-green radiation that is 510 nan nanometers is exactly the highest level of reception from the human eyes at night time. So you will see much better blue-green colors that any other blue colors or red colors because your night vision would be at its best <coughs> at night. So this is something we try to to deal with and to trick. And you usually you use blue to mark situation, to, to play with situation. Yeah, because there is no much reference with blue-green into the urban environment. You have a lot of sodium, a lot of uh, green colors, a lot of of uh, information that comes with colors like red is dangerous and so there is a lot of symbolism and for, for me blue green is a little bit out of any reference if you find a nice blue green if you find a, um, a pharmacy uh, blue green is no good <laughs> but um, this blue green gives you a lot of capacity of being well seen being totally different from the lit environment and also, for me, it's a warm color. Then it's also cultural, and we can discuss about that. But a lot of people think it's a warm color. I don't see it as a cold color. Because uh, blue, for me, is a cold color. And uh, especially with blue LEDs, it's really cold, and I don't like it. But blue-green remind me of Mediterranean Sea, so <laughs> it's warm. And uh, another thing? Sure. Sure. Uh, Normally, uh, you always uh, use white color for people, for, uh, gold uh, color for something else, or uh, you, you usually when when have to 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 project something, uh, usually you are free from every or you are some uh, internal rules. No, there's no internal rules. Well, 
you have habits, like everyone making a profession for so many years. So I have my own habits, but fortunately my project manager that is much younger than me do crazy things and I love it. So I, I leave them to do crazy things. Sometimes they, they do colored lighting into, for pedestrian or the project image for pedestrian and people get into the image, things I would never do. But this is the way should things be evolving, you know. And uh, I like the, the white light since the very beginning. I fight it for white light for the very beginning against all the technicians and all the public authorities. But I can understand that other people will like the other lights. And the best is to try. In this profession, try. If people like it, because we do it for people. It's why I finish always with people. We don't do it for ourselves because I'm not living in Hangzhou or in Zhejiang. I do the project and then I go back home. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there isn't something that always works <coughs> when you think about life. No, but you check. For example, the river, pro the first river project, we use also blue green light on buildings. And at the beginning, it was a very dark blue green. And um, the mayor was very clever. He said, let's try for three months because it was at the beginning a, a temporary installation for the bicentenary. And a lot of people complained. They say, wow, it's not nice, this color. And say, the mayor said, could we change the color? I said, yeah, we can make something lighter. We don't need to be a dense color. And again, we made a, a, an inquiry about opinions and people say, yeah, we really like this color. So you don't have to be, you know, you have to be open because again, you do that for other people. It's like any project. Normally, good architects should be aware of making things for others. <laughs> or landscape architects should be really aware to do things for others. So with lighting, we try to do things for others. Sometimes people complain, so well, we change the things. I mean, they're going to live into it. See, they don't. But sometimes they never experimented. So they have to experiment before complaining, because sometimes people know, I don't want this, this is a color I hate. And OK, but try it first. And like kids, you know, with food, try it first, and then you can complain. Today we've talked about, for example, the norm. In Lombardia, there is a law restrictive restrictive on the inclinement of the sun, and also in different Italian regions. Lei che si è rapportato con diversi paesi, quale differenza c'è? Cioè, c'è una differenza di normativa? Come si è rapportato lei? Che differenza c'è, insomma, anche come questi paesi vedono questi vincoli? Insomma? Well, there is a lot of difference. Um, Europe and principally Italy and uh, Czech Republic was the first one to make a law about uh, light pollution a long, long time ago already, even in France. We're starting to make regulation for light pollution, but just a couple of years ago. And we have not finished yet the regulation. So countries are different, and a lot of rules and regulation are different. In China, there is no laws against light pollution. They don't even care about pollution by itself. They're starting to think of how could we deal with pollution. Not talking of light pollution, but only pollution. So Chinese learn very, very quickly, and they will very in a fast way, make regulation about pollution first and then light pollution. But nowadays, there is no rules about that. So you can really do whatever you want, and uh, unless you don't harm people, you don't harm. Well, for example, the hill, they wanted to light, they wanted to uplight it with thousands and thousands of projectors. And I thought this was really crazy. And I convinced the mayor, I, I, I brought a lot of pictures of uh, animals living in the hill. And there was uh, pandas, because this is Sichuan. There were snakes, and there was bats. And, then, and I show him this uh, diaporama of animals. And I say, this is where the animals live, in the hills, up there. So you should not harm them. And then he said, OK, you're right. I, I won't do that. So they decide just to put some points. And so they learn very, very quickly. When you go to South America, there is no light uh, pollution laws. They have norms for very high level of lighting, unfortunately. <laughs> they ask for 60 lux in the public space, uh, and we do 10 lux uh, in the new projects, for example. Uh, because they always say it's safety and security reason, we really want high level of lights. 
We work also in Middle East, they ask us for 60 lux, 80 lux, and then we succeed to go to 10 lux after two years of fight. So you have first to believe to what you do and try to do it as good as possible in terms of um, you know being just honest with yourself. And then uh, if there is a regulation, but very often there is no this kind of regulation about the level of flight, for example, is just the habits. They think it would be good to do that. Then when there is regulation, for sure, you have to apply them. But many, many countries has no regulation for disabled people, relation with lighting, for lux levels, for um, the typology of lighting, for, you know, so very often we try to get them better. And in some case, we feel free to do what we want to do. Molto grazie a tutti. Quindi, alla prossima, al prossimo incontro nel mese di giugno. Grazie.